بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله صلاة والسلام على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه أما بعد The first chapter of Riyad al-Salihin Bab al-Ikhlas We read the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu after which we read several ayats from Allah's glorious book regarding the obligation of having the niyyah and purifying one's niyyah, checking one's niyyah and being aware of why you're performing a specific act and why you're avoiding a specific act. Then the author Noe mentions the second hadith of the chapter, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. He says, وَعَنُمِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أُمْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عَيْشَةَ رَضِيَ ta'ala anha. قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يغزو جيشنا الكعبة فإذا كانوا ببيداء من الأرض يخسف بأولهم وآخرهم قالت قلت يا رسول الله كيف يخسف بأولهم وآخرهم وفيهم أسواقهم ومن ليس منهم قال يخسف بأولهم وآخرهم ثم يمعثون على نياتهم متفق عليه وهذا لفظ البخاري إذا مشنز the narration of Aisha regarding those who will come and attack the Kaaba and how they will be caused to be swallowed up and devoured. Those who had the ill intention and those who were forced to be with them to drive their animals, to push their machines, or whatever the case may be. Wa alaikum as-salam wa And this hadith is in the Sahihain. The next uh, hadith summarizing it as well is also narrated by Aisha. Qalat qal al Nabiyu sallam la hijra ta ba'd al-fat wa lakin jihadun wa niyatun wa idha stunfirtum fanfiru mutafun alayhi. وَمَعْنَاهُ لَا هِجْرَةَ مِنْ مَكَةَ لِأَنَّا صَرَتْ دَارَ إِسْلَامٍ Aisha also narrated in Bukhari Muslim that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said لَا هِجْرَةَ بَعْدَ الْفَتْحِ There is no hijrah after the conquest of Mecca. No hijrah after the conquest of Mecca. However, there shall remain jihad and there shall remain niya, intention. There will remain fighting, struggling, and there will remain intention. وَإِذَا اسْتُنْفِرْتُمْ فَانْفِرُوا And whenever you are called upon, Whenever the leader mobilizes all of the Muslims, then you should go out and fight. And the hadith is agreed upon by Al-Bukhari and Muslim as well. No, he says that this hadith means there is no hijrah that's mandatory from Mecca to Medina because Mecca is now in Darul Islam. It's no longer controlled by the kuffar. The last hadith that we'll mention in this chapter in our summary is the fourth report. is narrated by Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. وعن أبي عبد الله جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري رضي الله عنهما قال كنا مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في غزاة فقال إن بالمدينة لرجال ما سرت مسيرة ولا قطعتم واديا إلا كانوا معكم حبسهم المرض وفي رواية إلا شركوكم في الأجر رواه مسلم وروى البخاري عن أنس رضي الله عنهما رضي الله عنه قال رجعنا من غزوة تبوك مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال إن أقوامنا خلفنا بالمدينة ما سلكنا شعبا ولا واديا إلا وهم معنا حبسهم العذر Jabir narrated that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, one day they were with him uh, went out to fight in Allah's cause and he told the companions إن بالمدينة لرجالا He says back home in Medina the many of your companions many men uh, every step that you have taken every valley that you have crossed every inch of ground they're with us and the only reason why they're not physically with us is because of an excuse that they had and they will have the reward just like you're getting the reward for physically walking and treading i.e. because of their intention they had the niyyah to go out with the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but sickness, blindness, uh, mandatory obligations back home in Medina oftentimes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may have told them to stay in Medina to look after the Muslims or as we say, to maintain the fort, to hold down the fort. You stay here and we'll go out, vice versa. But they still have the reward. Khayr, inshallah. So that's the end of the first chapter. The second chapter, the author, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he says, Babu Tawbah, Qalul Ulama, al tawbah tu wajibu tun min kulli dhanb. Fani kanat al-ma'asitu bayna al-abdi wa bayna Allah Ta'ala la tata'allaku bi haqi adami falaha thalathatu shurutin. Ahaduha an yuqli'a an al-ma'asiyah والثاني أن يندم على فعلها والثالث أن يعزم أن لا يعود إليها أبدا فإن فقد أحد الثلاثة لم تصح توبته 
وإن كانت المعصية تتعلق بآدمي فشروط أربعة هذه الثلاثة وأن يبرع من حق صاحبها فإن كانت مالا أو نحوه رده إليه وإن كانت حد قذف ونحوه مكنه منه أو طلب عفوة وإن كانت غيبة استحلها أو استحله منه أو منها ويجب أن يتوب من جميع الذنوب فإن تاب من بعضها صح التوبة عند أهل الحق من ذلك الذنب وبقي عليه الباقي وقد تظاهرت دلائل الكتاب والسنة وإجماع الأمة على وجوب التوبة قال الله تعالى وتوبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون وقال تعالى استغفروا ربكم ثم توبوا إليه وقال تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا توبوا إلى الله توبة نصوحا The author says chapter number two the chapter of Tawbah Bab Tawbah the chapter of repentance Anawi rahimahullah ta'ala says the ulama of Islam they say that Tawbah is mandatory for each and every sin that you commit Tawbah is mandatory for every sin that you make Every single sin that you perform or have performed, toba must be made therefrom or therefore. As far as if the toba or if the act of disobedience, the reason behind toba is based off of an act of disobedience that you have performed between you and Allah, and it doesn't pertain to another human being, it doesn't pertain to one of Allah's created beings, something that you made that's haram, that wasn't an act of oppression to anyone, of dhulm that you did to another person, he says, then there are three main essentials for this toba, Three main essentials. Three conditions. I.e., if you just say, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. Have mercy on me. Allah, forgive me what I'm about to do. Allah, forgive me for what I've done. And if it does not fulfill these three conditions, these three essentials, then it is not a real toba. It's not an actual toba. You may think that you say, I repented, but in actuality, you did not repent. Rather, the tawbah must be done in a manner similar to anything else in Islam. Salah, for example, you can't just pray when you want to pray, facing other than the qibla. You can't say what you wish to say. You can't read what you want to re recite. You have to do it in a specific way. And if it's not done in a specific way that's been commanded by Allah and His Rasul, you can pray all night until your feet become swollen and you have calluses on your feet. You have no salah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no prayer that you made even though you exhausted yourself. He says, so three conditions. Number one, an yukhli'an al ma'siyah, is the person has to stop sinning at the time of Tawbah. You cannot say, oh Allah, forgive me, and then pick up a glass of alcohol. Oh Allah, forgive me, why are you smoking the drugs? Oh God, may God forgive me for what I'm about to do. Everybody understand this? Future or present, but you have to stop the sin at that time when you're making Tawbah. If you go back to it, if you regress, if you relapse, if you fall back into it, that's a different story. But at the time of offering the tawbah, you have to be sober. You have to be clean from the sin. You cannot perform the sin and at the same time ask Allah for forgiveness. He says, number two, and yandama ala fitliha, is that you have to have regret. You have to feel bad. You have to have remorse. You can't rejoice in the sin. You can't find the sweetness of the disobedience and sit and daydream and think about it. But you must feel bad. It has to bother you. It has to disturb you. He says, And He says, thirdly, is that you have to have the resolve. You must have a resolute spirit. You must be determined not to go back to it. Not to do it again. If you go back to it again, it's a different story. You fall, you slip again, that's a different story. But at the time of Tawbah, it has to be done with decisiveness. But I'm not going to do it again. And you cannot offer the Tawbah with the intention of going right back to it. You cannot offer the Tawbah and you're finding the sweetness of the sin while you're asking Allah to forgive you. But you must have the decisiveness in your heart, in your mind. This is the last time. I'm not going to do it again. Oh Allah, give me strength. I have to leave this alone. I have to walk away from it. If you fall, you slip. That's a what? Different story. But at the time of the offering of Toba, one must have this azm. He says here, so therefore, if one of these three essentials is missing, there is not a valid Toba. He then moves on to say, as far as if the act of disobedience that you performed pertained to another human being, it wasn't something that was just an exclusive right of Allah, then there's a fourth condition, an additional essential. The previous three, and that you have to free yourself from the one that you oppressed. If it was wealth, 
give the wealth back. If it was slander, if it was backbiting, if it was speaking ill of the person, he says, if it was had the qaf, all right, you call someone a zani, you're a fornicator, you're a cheater, you're an adulteress or adulterer, so on and so forth. He says, مَكَّنَهُ minhu, In the state of Islam in which there's sharia, the person will basically say, look, take me to court if you like. Get, you can, huh? They can beat my back because I slandered you and I said that you're a fornicator. And the person says, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it. Then that's the tawbah. If he says, okay, come on, let's go. Now, I want my haq. You slander me unjustly. Okay? He says, anything like this, the person has to what? Go back to the person and free himself. If it was wealth, give the money back. If you're afraid, if you're scared, they're going to lock me up. The brother is going to fight me. He may shoot me. He may stab me. The brother is not ever going to forgive me. It's going to cause a bigger problem. Then just put the money where he can get it. Donate the money to his cause somehow. He'll get his banking information some way, but the mouth has to be what? Returned, directly or indirectly. If it's a possession, then put the possession on his step, on his porch, on the trunk of his car, however you can, but you cannot die. And you took someone's wealth or property unless the wealth or property is what? Give him back. It was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, before I was a Muslim. I don't know those people whose wealth that I stole. I robbed the people in Guatemala. I used to work for a business, all right? Poor, tiny, third world country. I don't know whose money I took. Then give it in charity on behalf of those people. Give it in charity on behalf of the person or the people whom you robbed, whom you stole the money from. He then says, uh, moving forward, he says, Toba is mandatory from all sins. There is no small sin that you don't have to make Toba or a major sin. There is no black lie, white lie. Uh, it's, it's just a small thing, you know, no problem. God is forgiving. He says, you must make Toba from all sins. One is not to misunderstand the concept of minor sins being expiated by righteous deeds. Everybody clear on this? That's a different issue. He says, Toba is mandatory from all sins. And if a person makes a Toba from one sin, but he still performs other sins, he says, then the correct view is that the Toba is correct. So let's say, for example, a person has a gambling addiction, a drinking addiction, and he's a womanizer as well, unfortunately. Brother, he goes into, he gets all three done in, in one place in the casino. Sleeps with women he's not supposed to sleep with, drinks what he's not supposed to drink, and he plays around with money that he's not supposed to play around with. Those are three major sins. Everybody understand this? So he went and he made hajj, and he felt bad, and he made repentance for his alcoholism, for drinking alcohol. But he still made zina, and he still gambled. So just because he made toba from the alcoholism, does, it, does that mean that he, all three things he had, that, or because he didn't make toba for the other two, for the women and the gambling, that the toba for the alcoholism is incorrect? No, he says no. He says, rather, his toba for drinking alcohol is valid, and he must fulfill the remaining two. And if he doesn't, it has nothing to do with what? That toba. Everybody understand this? It has nothing to do with that toba. I know Ibrahim al he then says, there's so many proofs in the kitab and in the sunnah, and the ijma of the Muslims, the total absolute consensus that toba is mandatory. It isn't something that's hidden, it's khilaf among the ulama, it's only Abu Hanifa's view, Shafi'i, some of the scholars, he says, all of the ulama ijma is that toba is mandatory. You must make toba from your sins. Allah the Exalted, he says in Surah An-Nur, Allah says, O you believers in Medina, repent to Allah, jami'an, all of you, perhaps that you will be successful. Allah the Exalted also says in Surah Hud, Istaghfiru Rabbakum thumma tubu ilayhi. He says, Seek Allah's forgiveness. Thumma tubu ilayhi. Then ask Him for tawbah. That's a discussion in itself. Is tawbah and istighfar, are, they, are, are those two things the same? When you say, Astaghfiru Allah, Atubu ilallah. Is istighfar and tawbah the same, or are they different? That's a long discussion in itself right there. The last verse that the author quotes is from Surah At-Tahreem, in which Allah addresses the believers once more. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. He says, O you who believe, tawbu ilallahi tawbah tan nasuha. He says, make a sincere repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a fake repentance, not a joke. 
He says, but really, honestly, earnestly, repent to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he quotes hadith number 13. وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال أو قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول والله إني لا أستغفر الله وأتوب إليه في اليوم أكثر من سبعين مرة رواه البخاري وعن الأغر بن يسار المزني رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الناس توبوا إلى الله واستغفروه فإن يتوب في اليوم مئة مرة وعن أبي حمزة عن سمن مالك الأنصاري رضي الله عنه خادم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لله أفرح بتوبة عبده من أحدكم سقط على بعيده وقد أضله في أرض فلاة متفق عليه وفي رواية لمسلم لله أشد فرحا بتوبة عبده حين يتوب إليه من أحدكم كان على راحلته بأرض فلاة فانفلتت منه وعليها طعامه وشرابه فأيش منها فأتى شجرة فاتجع في ظلها وقد أيس من راحلته فبينما هو كذلك إذ هو بها قائمة عنده فأخذ بخطامها ثم قال من شدة الفرح اللهم أنت عبدي وأنا ربك أخطأ من شدة الفرح ونبي موسى عبد الله بن قيس الأشعري رضي الله تعالى عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الله تعالى يبسط يده بالليل ليتوب مسيء النهار ويبسط يده بالنهار ليتوب مسيء الليل حتى تطلع الشمس من مغربها رواه مسلم The author he quotes narration of Abi Huraira رضي الله عنه he says, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Wallahi, he says, I swear by Allah. He says, in one day, I make repentance to Allah, I ask Him to forgive me more than 70 times. And this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in one day, he would ask Allah to forgive him over 70 times. What sins did he used to make? What disobedience did he perform? Yet and still, he constantly asked Allah to forgive him. So that should teach us to make an abundance of istighfar. If the Prophet والسلام, and we know what he was and who he was and what was his status and his relationship with Allah and what he did for Islam, he asked Allah to forgive him over 70 times. Some of us don't ask Allah to forgive us once in a day. Let alone three times, let alone five times, let alone ten times, let alone 70 times. Uh, and this hadith also teaches us a refutation of the modern people today who talk about the Prophet of Islam and they say negative things about him. They say he was just a military leader, a political leader. He was a womanizer. He was someone who manipulated his followers. He was just someone who wanted wealth and power and status for so on and so forth. Is this the speech of a military leader? All the quote unquote great military leaders of the 21st century, 20th century, let alone we go into the past. Did they say, I asked God's forgiveness over 70 times in one day? All of the great military leaders, then the political leaders, let alone a womanizer. Everybody understand this? Is this the speech of Alexander the Great? Did he ever say that? Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, Shaka Zulu, these great political military geniuses and combatants. Did they say, I asked forgiveness over 70 times in one day? So that does not mix, that does not match. That is like water and oil for someone who's thirsty for power, for wealth, for women, someone who wishes to control and dominate a people with nothing to do with religion and to say, I seek God's forgiveness over 70 times. Everybody understand this? That's not the speech of a womanizer. No womanizer talks like that. No one says, I ask God for forgiveness for what? That's not how people talk like that who use and take advantage of others. So that's false and that's a lie. And as we've said before, the best way to fight fire is with more fire. The Prophet ﷺ married Aisha when she was young. The Prophet married this woman. The Prophet fought this battle. The Prophet, the Prophet, tell you, where are you getting this information from? The non-Muslims, you listen to them, you watch them on YouTube, they say Tabri, Bayhaqi. They'll quote the different sources of Islamic history. Okay, did you not read in Sahih al-Bukhari? Did you not read in Sahih Muslim? Did you not read the traditional classical orthodox sources of Islam that you're getting this information from? Okay, no problem. The Prophet beheaded this man. Tight. The Prophet did this. Tight. The Prophet supposedly tortured this person. Tight. My best. But the other narrations in which the Prophet cried, the Prophet prayed, the Prophet gave to the orphan, to the widow, so on and so on and so forth. Did you not come across that? Everybody understand this? So it's a, a, a very staple trait and characteristic of those who attack and slander Islam. 
in most cases, if you watch some of those videos or listen to them, not saying that you should, but if you happen to come across them, you're going to find the following things. Number one, nine out of ten of them are not masters of the Arabic language. And if you're not a master of the Arabic language, which is the initial language of Islam and the source of its traditional or the, the, the traditional the traditional <laughs> sources, we don't have to make no explanation. If you want to study Christianity and you haven't mastered what? Hebrew. Latin, Hebrew, Greek. How are you going to do that? Doesn't make any sense. So in most cases, they don't even know Arabic, let alone master the Arabic language. And that's why you find when they quote in English sources, it's not just because they're speaking to an English-speaking audience. It's because they themselves do not know Arabic. Number two, you'll find them never quoting the proofs and evidences that clearly destroy and undo their arguments. Number three, most people, when they attack Islam, they only attack from the offensive. They'll gun, 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 gun. But never once do you see them answering the questions, the responses, and the rebuttals. But it's always attacking. And it's easy, and it looks very simple when I'm clicking through a PowerPoint presentation. Tabari, Bukhari, this one, this poet, this person said this, this historian said that, this statistic. That's simple. But when someone is doing something for Islam or attacking your faith, your Christian faith, or your Jewish faith, then that's a different story. How much of a scholar are you actually are? Everybody understand this? And those same proofs and evidences, those same different ways of picking apart religion are used by the enemies of Christianity, such as atheists. And if you read some of the books that atheists wrote on Christianity, for argument's sake, what you're saying about Islam is true. For argument's sake, about the manuscripts of the Quran. For argument's sake, the prophet married a young woman. For argument's sake, the prophet fought battles, violence, terror in the Quran. For argument's sake, if it came down to it, Christianity will be ten times worse in the views of an atheist with regards to the historical manuscripts of the Bible and how it was translated and where it came from and so on and so on and so on and so forth. So your argument is feeble. And that's the, that's the state of any bully who picks on someone who's smaller than him, weaker than him, more inferior than him. It looks easy. He looks strong because the person is smaller and weaker. But when there's an equal opponent or a greater opponent or someone that's still weak but has the courage to fight back, it's a different story. Are about understanding this? And this is critical to understand in 2017 when it comes to the, attack that are, the attacks that are levied against Islam because they are many. They are many. The Quran, Hadiths, history. Everybody understand this? It's not a small, simple thing. It's an actual war that the people are making 24-7 against Islam. So the, the layman Muslim, not a student of knowledge, not a scholar, but the basic layman, he has to be armed with certain principles. Certain basic principles to protect your faith from doubts. Everybody understand this? And these doubts are many, they are abundant, and they are various in the age of the internet and social media. The next narration, hadith number 14, is reported by al ghar ibn Yasar al-Muzni radiallahu anhu. He heard them, or the Messenger of Allah said, O oh mankind, repent to Allah and seek His forgiveness, because in one day I do this more than 100 times. The last hadith that we'll mention from the chapter is that of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the Sahihain as well. He says, Allah is happier with the tawbah of his slave than one of you who's in the wasteland. One of you who's in the middle of the desert. He's upon a camel and on this camel is his food and his drink. And he loses all of his provisions and then finds it. He says, Allah is happier when the slave makes repentance to him than one of you in this situation. And this hadith is in the Sahihain. And another version of this hadith in Sahih Muslim, the hadith says, Lallahu ashaddu farahan. It says that Allah is more happier than one of you. When he says when the slave makes tawbah, Allah is happier when the slave repents to him than one of you who is in the desert. He has his riding beast, and the riding beast walks away with his food, with his drink, with his mat, his covers, his weapons, all of his provisions to survive in his terrible horrible environment, the desert, one of the harshest places to be. It's not a forest where you can fish, you can get a leaf, you can climb a tree, you can find some fruit, some nuts, and you can find a root, you can eat mushrooms, not uh, in the tundra where you can drink ice, you can melt ice, huh? you can make an igloo, you can survive one way or another, you can fish, ice fishing, things like this, all right? The desert is what? 
nothing, barren, scorching hot, scorpions, snakes, sun. You die from hallucination, seeing a mirage. Everybody understand this? Certain types of cactuses, which are poisonous. Certain types of cactuses will cause a hallucination. If you eat it, if you drink it, you'll go crazy. The desert is reality, probably one of the worst places to die in. Everybody understand this? He says that all of your provisions is on this animal, and the animal goes away. So he finds a shrub or a bush or some type of tree like this, and he lies under it. He gives up. He expects death. And then all of a sudden he wakes up, and the camel came back to him with his food, with his drink, with everything he needs to survive and get to his destination. When he saw the camel, he said, Oh Allah, you are my servant. And I am your Lord. The Prophet says he said this horrible statement because he was so happy. Because he was what? He was so happy. He said, and this hadith teaches, he says that Allah is what? Happier. Just stop and look at the demographics of this hadith and just break it down. First and foremost, the hadith affirms one of Allah's attributes, and that is Sifatul Farah, the attribute of Allah's happiness. And it's no different than Sifatul Mahabbah. It's a real attribute. It's no different than Sifat al -ridha. It's a real attribute. It is an attribute. It's not figurative. It doesn't mean Allah will reward His slaves. Iradatul thawabihim. Iradatul in'am wal ihsan. That's false. Rather, it is a sifa that is a real sifa. And it is not figurative. It's actual. How is Allah's happiness? Is Allah's happiness like that of His slaves? Of course not. Do we know the details of Allah's happiness? No, we do not. But Muhammad Sallallahu who was more eloquent, who hated any type of tashbih or tajseem or tamthil or takif, anthropomorphism, so on and so forth, Muhammad Sallallahu himself, he made these words. And he says that Allah not only has a happiness, but it's a happiness that's greater than you can ever conceive. How is that? Think about death coming to you. Think about despair. You've lost hope of surviving and getting out of this situation. And then all of a sudden what? Relief comes, how happy would you be? If you were in a courtroom, you were on trial, first degree murder, you were on trial for something that will put you behind bars for what? The rest of your life. Or let's say what? The death penalty. And then you heard the verdict and they said what? Not guilty. What happens to the person? What does he do? How happy is he? Can words express his happiness, his gratitude, his thankfulness to the lawyer? Everybody understand this? So just think about now you're in the desert with nothing, plane crash. Everybody understand this? There's no way of living going back to your wife and your children. You're never going to see your family again in this life. You give up. Khalas. And then Allah sends these things back to you. How happy would you what? Would you be? The Prophet says that Allah is what? Is happier. Not with the one who prays all night. Not with the one who fasts all day. Not with the one who reads who does, but the one who makes a sin and returns back to Allah for something that he did wrong, Allah is what? Happier. So this shows us a tremendous virtue of Tawbah. That there's no reason or any way that a Muslim can think about committing suicide, killing himself, taking my life, and giving up and despairing. It's done. My life is over. I can never come back to Allah. I can never get it right. Because Allah is what? He's happy with the Tawbah. Uh, happiness that's beyond any type of description in our weak language. So the Prophet says that Allah is happy and Allah has a happiness which is beyond that which you can think about for Tawbah. This teaches us the tremendous virtue of Tawbah. This hadith also teaches us is that if a person makes a statement of disbelief, a statement of kufar akbar wa billah, out of an extreme mental state or, or, or he's extremely sad, extremely happy, or a person is coerced and forced, then they are not held accountable for that kufar wa billah. The last narration, the hadith of Abu Musa radiallahu anhu, chapter or hadith 16, he says that indeed Allah Azza extends his hand at night for those who do bad during the daytime to repent. And he extends his hand during the daytime for those who do bad at night to repent until the sun comes from the west. And the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. That hadith also teaches us the virtue of Tawbah and that Tawbah is available. It's can be, it can be performed. And Allah Azza wa not only commanded his slaves and ordered his slaves, but he also wishes to help his slaves achieve that goal and to actualize that commandment. Allah Azza wa says, يبسط, He extends his hand 
not for rizq, not for sustenance, not to give food and drink to the people, but for them to return to him. Does Allah have to do this? It's not enough that Allah says, repent to me, ask me my forgiveness. But yet and still Allah, what? He calls his slaves, he reaches out to his slaves, he encourages his slaves. Everybody understand this? For those who make sins to return to him. And hadith also shows us is that there are Muslims who may make sins at nighttime, in the daytime, and Allah wants them to repent. The sins not specific in the day, not those that are specific in the nighttime. Anytime that you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one must make tawbah. And hadith, hadith Abi Musa radiallahu anhu also affirms the attribute of the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a manner that suits his majesty. Just like all of Allah's names and all of Allah's attributes, they're literal, they're not figurative, they're not to be twisted and distorted to mean something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. He's the one we ask to allow us to make tawbah.